And just like that, right on time, there's the man himself. Everybody, welcome to Iconicon Day 3. And I want to uh, just give a warm welcome to a dear friend and a legend in his own field at the same time. First, we have Tom Burgess from I Grew Up Star Wars, uh, a dear friend of mine who has been devoted to vintage Star Wars toys. I mean, your whole life, pretty much. Um, and then the man himself... And I'm going to give him the top spot here. Uh, Kenner Star Wars designer, Jim Swearingen. Sir, how are you? Thank you for being here. <clears throat> I'm good. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. We can hear you. Yes, sir. Um, Hi, Jim. Hi. So, uh, Jim, I understand you and Tom, I guess, have interacted before. Uh, do you guys know each other? Uh, uh, I, Jim, I'm, I'll, I'll cut in. I'll, 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 I'll put it down. I, I've met you a number of times at, at celebrations, and I... I think you've remembered me, but listen, you've you've probably interacted with hundreds, if not thousands, of, of Star Wars fans. So, yeah, it's a little hard to differentiate one from another sometimes. And yeah. at my age, I can blame it on my age. So, <laughs> um, well, I'm I'm glad you're here, Jim. Thank you. Well, Tom, you, you, Tom, you've done so much for the the vintage Gen X Star Wars community. Uh, so, I'd really like to. I'd like to let you kick this off with Jim, this interview, if you like, with whatever questions. I know you've interacted with him in the past, but but whatever questions you have top of mind, I'd love for you to take the helm, as it were, with, with the first question, if that's cool. Sure. I'll start off with, uh, well, Jim, how did this uh, how did this whole thing with Star Wars begin back at Kenner? Well, back at Kenner. Uh I'll do a couple steps back, um, okay. which sometimes uh, fills in, you know, how the stars were aligning. I, I saw THX 1138, um, which was George's thesis film in college, when I was in college in 1971 at the University of Cincinnati. So that's the first time that I um, had any brush with George Lucas. The uh, second was um, when I was <clears throat> still I was working at Kenner. Uh, 1976, I was reading Starlog magazine, which was a fan magazine that started out as Star Trek and expanded. Absolutely. And the November issue in August of 76, there was a four paragraph article about Star Wars and uh, 20th Century Fox. And just by chance, you know, a couple months later, uh, the script for the movie Star Wars came into the studio where I worked. I was in preliminary design at Kenner, and we were in advanced concept area. And we looked at, at that time, we were looking at TV shows. Um, we had done the $6 million man. Um, we were viewing things like the uh, man from Atlantis and stuff. Um, but the script came in, and since I already kind of was primed, uh, David said, my, Dave Okada said, who wants to read this script? It's a movie called Star Wars. And I, I, uh, I kind of raised my hand quickly and grabbed it and said, that's my project. Just because I was, you know, I was kind of pre primed for it. And I took it home that night, read the script, brought it back to David and uh, told him to go in his office and read it. Take a couple hours and read through the script. And I said, there's a, a toy on every page of this. So um, that's how it all began. And then from there on, it was in part <clears throat> trying to convince our management or uh, maybe not convince, but uh, uh, make sure that they were comfortable doing a, a new movie, um, science fiction movie as a toy line. It had been turned down by everybody else. We were lucky enough that Mattel and Ideal and Mego, all the the other players um, had turned it down already. So it was uh, our good fortune, my good fortune, that uh, it was getting, it was landing in our, our lap. And uh, uh, we, 
after Dave read it and we kind of started convincing people that we should go ahead, um, we started developing product right from the start. So when what you you already had, uh, I mean, Kenner already had experience with the six million dollar man and and that kind of thing. Was it was it something? I know you had read the script first, um, but um, I, and I know it was something you were excited about. But was it something that reading the script? You said that there was a toy on uh, every uh, every page. Were you? Were you imagining the the toys as you were reading the script, or was that yeah. was that solely you with with design ideas and that kind of thing? Or well, we had seen uh, we got a black and white set of uh, prints from the uh, live action that was already complete, and okay. we had we had a snapshot and a uh, a snapshot of an X wing and a Tie fighter and uh, kind of a top view. Uh, three-quarter view of uh, Millennium Falcon. And that's what we started with. Um, and I, from the start, we weren't going to start at 12-inch figures. We, Six Million Dollar Man and G.I. Joe were at kind of the leads in uh, boys' action. But um, along with, I think, at the same time, Big Jim and some other uh, characters have been done. But the sure. thing that really was, when I'm reading it, you know, I'm, I was 27 at the time. I'm kind of upside down. Now I'm 72. But when I was 27, I'm, I'm thinking, well, as a seven-year-old boy, what would I want to be doing if I'm reading the script and I'm imagining things? I wanted to do the X-Wing and TIE Fighter dogfights that were described in the script. So it was, we had to figure out, you know, immediately it meant that we would do it in a smaller scale. So that's where it all started. Was I saw the X-wing and Tie Fighters and the ships as being the centerpiece of the toy play, and then uh, we went from there. Well, that that that's a perfect uh, transition, not transition, but we're right on my first question, which was, you know, discussion of scale trends in the toy industry, and and scales do go through trends. Right now, we're seeing a six-inch uh, action figure scale trend, mm -hmm. um, but how difficult are those trends to break? when for example you guys said you know we've got to make these figures smaller because the vehicles are going to be the centerpieces of this line was that a hard sell to the brass who was doing very well with six million dollar man and even had a 12 inch star wars figure line as part of the rollout was that a hard thing to sell them on no i think no as a as i you know recall it uh, some 45 years ago it was uh they we they let the the creatives be the lead on this. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why I got to do so much of the early stuff on my own without marketing people around. Um, but uh, they trusted our judgment as much as, uh, as any, and we're, we were kind of free to do whatever we wanted. The 12 inch uh, figures were kind of a sideline because we did have six million dollar man and there was a market for it, but really the play the play part of the, the, you know, Bernie Loomis's famous uh, toyetic part of it was the ships, mm -hmm. the recent initial run. Um, and they really needed, and they really needed to be at a scale where we could, we could play with them. A 12 inch uh, X-wing fighter would have been exciting, but you wouldn't be able to lift it up. So, right. <laughs> right. Yeah. And that would have been incredibly expensive as well to buy. Uh, you know, yeah. But really cool. Yeah, oh. for sure. Um, hey, Jim, so I want to ask you a ahead, question. Maybe I'm getting ahead of myself here, but mm -hmm. you said that you had a lot of, uh, uh, you know, you were part of the decision making as far as as the the designs went. Did you uh, did you have any say in the figure selection of the characters at all? <laughs> That's a great question. I I. Um... I often get a question. I, I did. I did. I mean, I did pretty much select the first eleven, uh -huh. um, and I. The the question I always get when I'm doing these live is, uh, why didn't we do Grand Moff Tarkin earlier? I mean, it. It he he didn't get his uh, due for a long time, so right. I. 
just and what see it's fortuitous i i i was getting ready to go to an event i was at one last weekend and uh I, I don't know where it came from i looked at i have a i should pull it out i have a copy of my memo to kenner's management um, of all the characters kind of listed down. And um, Grand Moff Tarkin was not number 12, but he was 13 or 14. So I can, I can as I usually do at events, I say, well, that was marketing's fault. <laughs> but now I, have, now I have proof that he was in the top 15 for sure, because I have my memo. So, but uh, yeah, I did, I mean, you know, I did pick the, you know the rent the original renderings were of the first nine and then expanded to 11 or 12 when i did the 3d stuff so but uh, that, that initial run was pretty much up to me because i didn't have a mark we didn't they didn't assign a marketing person until may so i was already already uh way ahead of that by the time we uh got to may and the movies came out so it sounds to me that there was a cap on how many figures were going to be in the first run. Yeah, yeah a dozen made sense because okay. I'm pretty sure they were shipped as 24 packs and you could adjust the, the uh, pack out ratios. I see. So. The, uh, the, the whole thing of, about assortments I, I find fascinating because that's one of the big questions that that you've experienced from us as fans now who were collecting these as kids and playing with them um i know that you worked on star wars for several years throughout the run of that of that uh toy series one mm -hmm. of the big questions that's become a, a run-on um joke toward me with uh in this youtube channel is that michael doesn't understand they always joke michael doesn't understand why kenner never did Bespin Cloud City as a true plastic play set like they did with the Death Star and the Ewok Village. Um, do, do you know, and I'm saying this in general, not just specific to Cloud City, but how did you guys determine what locations and vehicles were sort of nah and what locations yeah. and vehicles were a, were an instant, you know, mandatory green light? How did, how did you guys weigh those options? Well, it, uh, yeah, I was I was involved for the first two and a half years. Mm -hmm. um, so um, the cloud city and stuff was a little later, but right. the way that worked after um, after we we uh, had a product manager and somebody from marketing involved, and we had turned a lot of things over to pre from preliminary design. What we did was we'd mock things up, we'd do some preliminary costing. Um, and then we would turn things over. So uh, we prototype some stuff. We'd make the initial uh, presentation models that were used internally. Um, then the marketing people once, uh, and I'm not sure, the, I think Jim Black was the first product manager. Uh, they would have worked with uh, me and then eventually they'd be doing production design people, um, picking those things out. And I think <clears throat> uh, the, Death Star, well, the Death Star was um, kind of preordained because it was the the big mm -hmm. uh, the big ship. Yeah. Um, the uh, Cloud City, it, it might have been just that it wasn't felt to be a, an important enough part of the mm -hmm. storyline, but that was a kind of a collaboration between production design and and uh, marketing. I right. didn't uh, prelim prelim. Um, didn't stay involved in Star Wars like the initially it was a hundred percent. We were until May of '77. We were involved with every aspect of it, mm -hmm. and then once we started turning things over, like the action figures, <clears throat> when we turned it over after the first twelve, they didn't need prelim to to tell them what to do. They we would get the information from. Lucasfilm, and then we work from there. But that could all be done in a production design group. I see. They, you know, you, we weren't going to, uh, until Boba Fett, um, all of that, all the figures after the first 12 were uh, a collaboration between production design and marketing. And so you got, film, of course. 
So you guys were basically the ones who built the stopwatch and wound it up. And once you had all that ready and the and the watch was working, you guys could say, okay, we're we're going to move on to something else. Yeah, in a lot of respects. Mm -hmm. And I and I stayed involved a little longer than prelim because I had built up a relationship with uh, the marketing people at Lucasfilm. So if there was something we needed, um, you know, I sent a long list of sound effects that I sent to Ben Burt, who was the sound guy. Um, saying, you know, we might need this. Um, so I would get, he would do, you know, he would send us recordings. And of course, uh, today everybody's, you know, you did, we couldn't do it by, uh, they couldn't send it in a, a, a voicemail or a, right. or a email. You, we had to actually get reel to reel tape and stuff. So, wow. You know, we're, we were, we were actually most of, Star Wars was designed with pencil and paper initially, mm -hmm. and um, there was no digital files or anything or any. Uh, we had, to, and if you wanted to photograph, somebody actually had to get a camera out and take a picture and uh, and then have it uh, developed. So it was right. it was a whole lot slower getting things done, and we tried to think ahead. So when I made long lists of things, it was to try and head off the delays because mm -hmm. initially they didn't uh, when we were doing the x-wing and tie fighter and i said well i need you know a top and a bottom view and a side left and right <clears throat> all these views and stuff they had some snapshots but they didn't have much you know of the you know they had to go back and look for blueprints and things that we could work from mm -hmm. so it was a whole different kind of thing now it's um, they work far, and we were only work. The other thing we were working in February, March, and April before the movie. Now, when the movies are being developed, the toy people are already involved in. Uh, they're already getting digital files. Sure. Right. Yeah. Uh, I have a few. Actually, we talked about you talked about the Death Star real quickly. Um, I want to go back because I'm really curious. I mean, there's all kinds of little gimmicks on the playset itself, the, the swinging across the chasm. And, and then of course the, the trash compactor was where there, were there little gimmicks for that particular playset set that, that didn't make it in that you folks had ideas for maybe parking the millennium Falcon, you know, in a, in a, like a hangar type thing or, yeah. or was, well, our Millennium Falcon would have, wouldn't have fit in our Death Star, but right. I actually have a friend that's uh, done what, what what we originally designed the Death Star to be. He's got nine Death Stars, and he's uh, doing a full round. And he took he's taking one section and changing the scale, and has it set up with a miniature. One of the, I think it's a die cast Millennium uh -huh. Falcon, and doing the the uh, docking bay for the okay. um, Millennium Falcon. So, um, if we had continued that, maybe we would have done that. But um, I can't think of any features we didn't. You know, it would have been kind of cool to have the the uh, prison chamber and stuff. Mm -hmm. But uh, and yeah. we and you had to kind of interpret. You know, we're we're. Um, by the time we were developing that we were we did see the movie so um so we we built it around some of the more important features more when, important action things when you were watching the movie i'm i'm sure you were all feverishly taking notes and yeah <laughs> well i got to i was you know, the the funny thing is you know and we were we got invited to the first screening it was a market research screening in San Francisco. And I was the only one that went. It was like, well, yeah, you can go. And I was like, well, great. And, and nobody else came. The marketing people, I guess they hadn't actually assigned it a marketing manager. And um, so Dave said, go ahead and go. And I, I went and saw the movie and it was, you know, I'm, I, <clears throat> I knew as much as anyone else in the world other than people at Lucasfilm and um, got to go to the movies. It, it was on May 1st. So I had, I saw it first on May 1st and then I saw it the next day down in, uh, in LA with uh, the press. 
Mm -hmm. So I got to see it with the only virgin audience. Oh, wow. And, and then I got to see the press and they're all jaded. So, but coming out of that, uh, they started naming it the best movie of the year. Excuse me one second. Sure. <coughs> Not no used problem. to talking so much. But uh, yeah, so seeing the movie uh, and then once, you know, as the movie opened and Kenner was signing contracts or at least signing letters of uh, intent, then everybody in the company got to go see it in the May. So. so after watching it that first time, I mean, what what were you feeling when you left the theater, when you left the screening room? Did were you I, just okay? We're this is this is going to make millions for us. Kenner is going to just kill yeah. it with this stuff. Well, I, yeah, I I experienced like I said, the Virgin audience. The people had been invited to see a movie, um, but they didn't know what the movie was. You know, they I think the 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 invitation <clears throat> said see a movie called Alaska, which is on the marquee. And um, the 300 people, they had a THX sound system they just put in and uh, cleaned the carpets and stuff. And to be in that audience, and it, it really is going back, the hardest part of it is being there by yourself. Um, because as you, you know, as Star Wars came on the screen, you kind of, people are like, what's this? And then the next thing that happens is, the crawl starts and you can hear people reading out loud. You know, it's kind of, <laughs> some people have a bad habit, but, um, and then the princess ship and the, the, you know, starts off and now you've got people kind of really tuning in. And then as the destroyer came overhead, it was like the subwoofers that they had installed <coughs> had uh, were seat shaking because they had the subwoofers turned up. So that when the engines came in, it was just, it was all out. And then next three hours, and then when the Death Star blew up, people lived, were leaping out of their seats and cheering. <laughs> um, <laughs> and the, the hardest part is I couldn't turn to anybody and say, did you see that movie? <laughs> you know, kind of, <laughs> yeah, right. And uh, while they were filling out their market research reports, I had to go out and find a pay phone and try and call back to Cincinnati to tell people what they missed. Oh. And then for three weeks, you know, after seeing it twice and then another three weeks, I, I you know, nobody else, n nobody else is going to see it. And then uh, uh, until the, you know, it actually opened in theaters, it was like, I was blown away at the beginning. And then that's like so frustrating because you can't, you know, you, you see all this, you know, and you describe it, but it's nothing like being there. So right. it's pretty intense, uh, pretty intense. And it uh, can't be recreated. That's the only part that's also sad is you can't recreate that. Um, real quick, Tom, hold whatever thought you've got. I got two quick things, but I want you to keep going. Uh, Carl Rudy, he sends in a super chat saying, thanks for putting this together, guys. You're very welcome. And then uh, we have uh, Wicked Person. And he says, this is awesome. And thank you for being here, Wicked Person. And we have a number of people in the chat. You can make this a short answer, Jim, because I'm sure you've gotten this question a thousand times. Uh, so like I said, Tom, hold your thought. Um, everybody in the chat, it's not me, everybody. I can prove it. If, if you guys start saying it's me, I'm going to pull all your comments up. Uh, they're all asking, why was Luke's lightsaber yellow in the Kenner original line? <laughs> Another question from the... Well, in the beginning, Michael's question actually. Well, what I promise, I wasn't the one asking. It's not even in my list. Yeah, that's okay. and I, and I, my own, my, the best answer I can give you is that we, we, Luke didn't actually have a lightsaber. Mm -hmm. That's one. Uh, he was he um, he got a hold of his dad's, which may have been an earlier version of what he used eventually. But um, we had a blue lightsaber for Obi-Wan and we put a red lightsaber in in uh, Darth Vader. And <clears throat> we need another color and red, yellow, and green, or red, blue, and yellow are the primary. So, sure. And Lucasfilm went along with it. So, wow. It probably yeah. just, you know, it's just by chance that we picked up yellow and not green. <laughs> but, 
Luke Skywalker would have eventually would eventually build his own lightsaber, mm -hmm. and he could have picked any color he wanted. So I guess that's the right. Yes, it, he. You know, we just picked the that uh, the wrong kyber say crystal or something. <laughs> Jazilla, they should, just, they should have just followed Kenner's lead and just went with yellow. That would have been fantastic. Oh yeah, I I want I want to redo the effects and just make it yellow <laughs> because of how we grew up. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Jazilla says, uh, Jim Swearingen, the man who started me doing yard work to earn money to buy the toys he designed. Thank you for the awesome childhood toys. Still have them. Um, Tom, sorry about that little detour. Back to you. Oh, no. I was I, I, <coughs> with the production of the figures, Jim. Um, I know that uh, you had to start from somewhere. And uh, I think you just went with you know, to show Lucasfilm, <coughs> you went with something. That, Sorry. You went with something that was already available, and you had modified these figures. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about how how the prototypes got started and and what you did? Yes. Um, well, we needed figures. I, I the initial presentations were all done on board. They were pen and ink drawings with magic marker color and stuff can i can i move let me move this here real quick i got something to show you here sorry about that are those them no oh, okay those were the uh those those must be the uh the sorry about that that's that okay those, those done done by, the card yeah. back uh 12 those 12. were done by an artist who was working for the packaging group okay uh, and they were used for some other stuff my stuff was much more um less finished and i i wish i had a good reproduction of it but i don't i have a really bad xerox of a xerox but um the initial boards were done um the figures were i don't know two and a half inches tall or so <coughs> but when we when we uh needed the step would have been we showed the figures we talked about them and then the next step was to do mock-ups mm -hmm. I'm sorry. <coughs> I've come back with a little bit of a cold. Oh, no but problem. I have the I have one of this is this is the uh, this is this became Darth Vader. <laughs> um, there he is. He started as a fireman, and there's a story about um, Bernie Loomis putting his fingers up and saying, "You know, make him this big," and Dave right. kind of measured it and all that stuff. And it turned out to be three and three quarter inches tall. Um, that's a really good story that I enjoy thoroughly. But this guy is three and three quarter inches tall. So mm -hmm. somewhere in lies the truth. But I I used something that we uh, for the preliminary mo models was something at hand, and uh, these had this articulation we needed, and we hacked them up. I. I used my, I'm not a sculptor. We had some very talented sculptors, but um, my initial models were uh, were done with uh, body putty and an exacto knife. Kit bashing. And if folks you don't know, the, that uh, that figure and uh, that figure line are adventure, fig, uh, adventure people from Fisher Price, which was yeah. an amazing bit of figures to to mm -hmm. in their own right yeah there was a kid that uh a, in a bathing suit that became a, a, a jawa <laughs> so it's kind of like Perfect. adventure people co do cosplay <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah exactly uh, that's a good way to look at it they uh they were very helpful in getting us off the ground and uh and they were very useful and uh, we had a really talented uh model shop that built the original the concept for the lightsabers initially um and a lot of you know they built r2d2 and things like that so uh, it was definitely a group effort and once things got rolling it was really important that a lot of emphasis be put on star wars did you Jim, you you had the privilege of seeing the movie, like you said, twice, once with the original audience and then the press. So, you know, you ran back to that phone booth, you're talking to your team and you're saying, you know, I wish you could have seen what I just saw. It sounds to me like you knew 
that this toy line was going to do really well. Like you knew you were just like that you could feel it. What was the what was the tenor of everyone else at Kenner prior to the film as far as as to how it would do? I know they 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 licensed it so they had some faith in it, but yeah. You kind of seemed to know this was going to be astronomically successful. What was their pre-seeing the movie take uh, on the property? Well, I, I'm not sure that I knew it was going to be, but I had a pretty good feeling about it. Mm -hmm. I the, the marketing group was probably still a little skeptical. Mm -hmm. um, the last, uh, before Star Wars, the closest movie property that was a toy line was uh, was actually uh, Planet of the Apes, I think, mm -hmm. which was a figure line, <clears throat> I think about six inches tall. Mm -hmm. um, the Star Trek line that was did not have any figures, I don't think. Mm -hmm. That was <clears throat> one of the things that uh, made Lucas keep track of the uh, merchandising. Mm -hmm. I'm really sorry. Um, no, you're you're fine. You're fine, sir. If you need to, if you need to if you take a break and take some water, that's fine too. No, that's all right. Mm -hmm. uh, I do have some water, mm -hmm. but um, the Star Trek line had kind of screwed the licensing for star science fiction mm -hmm. uh, because they'd done such terrible product. Um, you know, they did a my favorite Star Trek product <laughs> before Playmates got a hold of it mm -hmm. was a um, it was a yellow hard hat with a red beacon on top yeah i remember that on it. it was like uh, you couldn't do a much worse product line for that tv show and right. the movie and the tv show had been off for a while they um but when ron barry talked to lucas he said hold on to the merchandising lines so um now I've digressed to the point where I don't. What was the question again? Oh no, I was just I was just asking what their what their feeling oh, was about the movie. Yeah, yeah. I think yeah. the Matt, the the good thing about uh, Kenner at the time, Bernie Loomis let the creative people lead some of the stuff. Mm -hmm. And if you were really passionate about it, he wouldn't shut you down. What had happened to the other in the other toy companies is that marketing people took a look at a movie. <laughs> based on science fiction and opening in May and said, there's no freaking way we're going to do this. Mm -hmm. yeah. And luckily Bernie said, it's a movie. You well, know, that's a little chancy and it's science fiction. We haven't done that. I mean, six million dollar man was kind of science fiction and opening May was a little, you know, was a little kind of a problem, but, um, they were like, well, if you really think this is good, we'll keep going. And then we kept going and mm -hmm. it, 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 they felt a whole lot better. Everything, you know, they were going back and forth with uh, letters of intent and all. But when, you know, middle of May, when Time Magazine came out and called it best movie of the year, they were like <coughs> a whole lot happier. <coughs> Oops, excuse me. Mm -hmm. But it was, it was not an easy sell on uh, on their part and that's part of the reason <clears throat> kenner got such a great deal right I mean, right they were, you know the deal points were incredible and you know if you've watched i don't know if i can see this here the toys that made us uh-huh jim kipling our lawyer took great pleasure in writing the contract the uh, the idea that he would write galactic rights forever at the deal points that they made uh, took, you know, for the, for our side, it was a tremendous deal. Yeah. And for Lucas, it was kind of a deal that <coughs> he regretted. <coughs> he read it, regretted a little bit. Sure. Me for a minute. I'm going to go off screen for a minute. No and, problem. And blow my nose. No problem, sir. Right. Do what you got to do. <laughs> I will uh, do this right there. There you go. Um, but now you can see my little tiny collection. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I can't. I can't imagine a Jim Swearingen collection of Star Wars is any good at all. <laughs> it's not. not. Well, well, I, I only have a collection. I, uh -huh. This is really off the subject. The only reason I have a collection is that uh, 
I have uh, a number of people that are collectors who found out I didn't, for example, I didn't have the first 12 figures. I, um, and so they put together, I have a collection that they put together for me. Wow. And I, oh, and I the only okay. things, the only things I have that are, I'm trying to think this is backwards. Uh, <laughs> there's an X-Wing and a TIE fighter above me uh -huh. in the box. Those are the ones I gave my mother. Oh, wow. oh really? So she never got them out of the box. So that's a good thing. And I put them in their curly cases now that I got them back. But perfect. Wow. Too, too many people had, you know, birthdays and, you know, Christmas and stuff. And rather than going out to buy something, I'd probably pick something up at, at work and give it away. Uh, we have a comment here from Scuba Pete. He says, Jim, what's your favorite chili and why is it Skyline? I'm assuming... <laughs> Well, if I had to pick a, a chili in Cincinnati, it'd be Skyline. Uh huh. Although I do have friends that own Dixie Chili, so I should have a shout out to Dixie because they are friends of mine, and they they run a close, well, not even second, but <clears throat> and I don't eat a lot of chili, but <laughs> I understood. If you've uh not been to Cincinnati, Skyline Chili is the lead chili company. It's I'm going to get I'm going to get scuba for uh for throwing for th throwing that out there without giving me any context cuz I was like wait what but I assumed you would understand what he meant. I did, yeah. Yeah. Um it's Tom, uh yeah. yeah I I just wanted to give you the floor if you had something you wanted to ask or Oh, I'm I'm just curious um uh well, as you can see I've got some things there as well, Jim. Mm -hmm. And there's there's something right above me as well, but um I'm just curious about a particular figure in the 12 inch. I mean, the, the, the first 12 line mm -hmm. and uh, it's a, uh, it's a character that I hold dear and near to my heart. It's the uh, death squad commander. Now let, we're <laughs> the, I'm not, don't want to talk about the name of the, the figure, but correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, you look at a figure like that, and then, of course, you said that, uh, you know, uh, Grand Moff Tarkin was in the uh, in the lineup, but didn't make it because it was number 13 or 14. <laughs> Can we assume that uh, Death Squad Commander is is kind of the every Imperial um, of the lineup? You've got the Stormtrooper and you've got Darth Vader, but uh, are we to just assume that this guy filled in every other every other uh yeah. mook of the empire yeah that's I, I would i assume that but i again i didn't add him there he was he was added once he was in production design so <clears> that <throat> was that was the 12th figure yeah <coughs> very interesting very interesting. that that is very interesting um it, it's it amazes me tom how how you know star wars not it doesn't amaze me why star wars was successful but kenner you know jim you guys really nailed the the formula for how to make an action figure line pop you know and 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 appeal to children um you know with the, the figures and the vehicles that interact and the right settings and play sets and and i was always curious about if you're aware or if you have a personal professional opinion about why Star Wars did so well as a toy line and Indiana Jones did not, even though you guys put as much heart and soul into Indiana Jones as you did Star Wars and the, and the toys are now considered universally excellent by collectors. Um, and because they're both from Lucasfilm, do yeah. you have a, a theory or a working bit of info about why you feel Indiana Jones didn't capture the kids like Star Wars did? Well, my guess would be that it is it wasn't as expansive as mm -hmm. Star Wars was. I mean, uh, when you look at how many genres Lucas brought into uh, Star Wars, mm -hmm. you know, we were on desert planets and jungle planets and out in space, and <clears throat> you had the evil you know, the evil empire and stuff. Um, I think uh, Indiana Jones had a narrower, a narrower, narrower view. Mm -hmm. So it was maybe that. I don't 
no, I don't know. We oh, okay. Um, plus, it was kind of old fashioned. Sure. It was aimed. It probably knows when I when I was a kid. It was Hopalong Cassidy and Roy Rogers and uh, Tonto and all those characters. You know, I <clears throat> those are things that were more familiar to me. It's like today, uh, cars from the '30 don't appeal to kids, you know, millennials like they did to me. Right. And cars in the 60s and stuff. But um, it's a little bit of what you're familiar with. And I don't think that Indiana Jones had a, as broad a, as broad a, a, a spectrum of, of adventures mm -hmm. as Star Wars. Gotcha. There's a few design questions that I have for you, um, such as, let me start with the, the Stormtrooper figure. Was there was there a reason that the the head or the helmet of the that particular figure was fixed to the body? Was there a, a reason that you maybe remember why that was? Uh, most likely, we didn't do it. We didn't have it removable because of cost. Okay. Well, not uh, removable, but you know, you the heads of the other figures, you know. Uh, were, 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 oh, they didn't have articulation. No. Right. 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 Yeah. <laughs> I think it might have been just cost. I see. Okay. But, um, those kind of, you know, it could have just been, oh, let's just, you know, they, they didn't move their heads very much. And who, you know, but a, a lot of that was cost issues. Because we so were, I, our A price was $1.99. Mm -hmm. they, right. they sold for $3. So. So I'm way, assuming that's it's way different sorry. than today. So yeah, so I'm assuming that's probably why you went with with the vinyl capes rather than yeah. rather than anything more pricey for for Princess Leia and or Ben Kenobi or something like that. Yeah, was, yeah, that those are all. I mean, we were looking at pennies. You know, mm -hmm. those things all cost uh, pennies to manufacture, and we were. Um, we were we were trying to meet uh, retail prices. You know, I we could have done a lot more if you know those figures were selling for twenty five dollars. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I always, you know, I went out and bought an X wing a while back for a TV thing that we did here in town, and you know my my X wing fighter cost fourteen ninety nine retail, and I went out and bought one for fifty nine ninety five. It was like sticker shock. Oh sure. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So which would explain, you know, the sticker on the R2, um, mm -hmm. the uh, electroplating on C3PO was, was fantastic. Was, was that th something uh, it may not be in your wheelhouse, but was mm -hmm. that something that you wanted to go in with at the, at the, at the very first, at the, at the beginning, uh, yeah. making C3PO electroplated or? Yeah, they would. Yeah, we were. I mean, he was one of the key characters, and uh, so that would have been part of the. And there's no decoration on him, so except for the gold, <clears throat> right, right. And ours never had a silver leg, so. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's true. Or a red. Uh, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> or the red arm. <laughs> uh, uh, one other question before before I toss it back to Michael. Um, Talking about cost of figures, we started with a vinyl cape for the Jawa mm -hmm. at the very beginning. And then soon after we switched to um, the, you know, the fabric cape. Um, was that because um, you, Kenner, felt that you weren't, it wasn't, uh, there, there was no value there because of the size of the figure? Or were you adding some kind of value to it with the with the fabric cape well the the first model was had the fabric cape dave like okada, the sock, the sock story yeah dave okada's sock was was on the original <laughs> model that got turned over and i think it probably got pulled out because of the cost yeah. and did the vinyl cape and then went back to the fabric cape because the vinyl may have i don't know they may have trouble with 
getting them on the figures and stuff. They were all done in China, but <coughs> it was a lot of manipulation. Uh, so it's just, what you're saying is the size of the figure could have made the installation at the factory more complex because he was a lot smaller and fiddly. I think I just killed the stream. <laughs> that that was me. I turned off oh. my mic while I. Oh, oh okay. Um, the vinyl, the uh, the fabric cape um, would have been cost reduced originally, mm -hmm. and then they went back to it for whatever reason. Maybe that may it might have been a value thing. Mm -hmm. You know, people said, "Hey, I've got this little tiny figure, and he's got, you know, it's not enough value." And they may have gone back. Marketing may have said, "Well." How much does a cape cost? Can we throw the cape in and right. balance it out with the other line, parts of the line? Those are all, you know, production issues that would have been solved by the marketing and engineering company. Sure. Well, so I, when Mark, go ahead, yeah, go ahead. No, go ahead. Uh, with uh, with uh, talking about marketing. You know, we, we've got the first 12 and now we're, we're moving over to 20 the, the next year or 1979, I believe it was. Um, the selection of the figures was kind of out of your jurisdiction at that time, I guess, for lack of a better way to describe it. Um, I'm assuming that these figures now uh, we're talking about the the death star droid and r5d4 and then the cantina figures i'm assuming that those kind of were created to fill the play sets that were also coming out at that time the creature cantina and uh uh of course filling in the gaps with a little bit of the death star play set am, am i pretty safe to assume that that was the reason for the the choice of these figures because again we're now moving into 20 figures and there's still, you know, no Grand Moff Tarkin and that's not going to happen for another 20 years. So the figures, the, the figures, did the figures kind of uh, follow the lead of the play sets that were coming out? Yeah. Uh, well, to some extent, yes. I mean, uh, they would have picked the cantina or whatever they're going to do. And sure. you know, one that have at least a couple figures to throw in there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, we got did a Death Star, but don't grab up or Tarkin. <coughs> Excuse me. Mm. I, uh, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm just going to keep, keep going, Michael. <laughs> oh no, pro Tom! Um, I want you to keep going. I I'm enjoying this. Please keep keep going. Well, I'm pulling poor Jim's ear. I mean, I'm asking him every stupid nerd fan question I can think of. Well, again, uh, no, if that if, if that's what you've always wanted to ask, then by all means, sir. As well, long as Jim is okay answering it, you're okay to ask it. So, I, right. I'm well, Jim has left stupid questions. <laughs> <laughs> well, Jim hasn't left yet, so that's good. So, um, everything has a lot to do with the cost and and the price of production. Um. And I'm sure that had everything to do with the the cardboard backgrounds of of these play sets that came out then after the after the Death Star because the Death Star comparatively with the with the the play sets that were about to come out the Death Star was quite the pinnacle and it's it's always been considered the pinnacle of play sets during the vintage era, mm -hmm. but then you turn around and, and we're going with the cardboard backdrops was that that was also a cost consideration but was was there anything that was created prototype wise that was more than what we got as far as the play sets the 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 cardboard back play sets uh i don't think i <clears throat> it was all about cost yeah and right. points but um and it could have been, you know, uh, it's hard to think what what was going on on the economy back there, and you know, in the later '70s and early '80s. But <clears throat> most of it was cost issues, and I can't think of anything that would have been 
um, more interesting than the Death Star that they would have gone. Like the Cloud City could have been interesting, but right, you could have done something. But the, uh, again, most of that stuff was happening after I released. <clears throat> I let my I let my baby fly. <laughs> it was like uh, I still right. worked. Up, but I wasn't, and I was kind of a go-between, but I wasn't uh, intimately involved in all that decision stuff. Yeah, it's it's just fascinating to me that you would create, you know, Kenner would create these high-ticket items like the sand crawler. Yeah, and the sand crawler was 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 pretty expensive, if I remember correctly, and that was was completely done in plastic. And not only that, it was it was somewhat remote controlled. Yeah, and then you know we fall back to these these less expensive infinitely less expensive play sets like the creature cantina but then you've got figures dedicated to yeah. uh you know plastic back uh, or uh, the cardboard backdrops so mm -hmm. just just kind of a a fan fan observation on my part yeah well we weren't 100 percent right on everything so according to me you you did no wrong jim <laughs> uh, kenner surely did no wrong either so um, again, well, it was, it's a hard act to follow every time. So it was, it was, a great, I, <clears throat> it was probably the, the most exciting time at Kenner, you know, in the boys toy era for sure. I mean, well, that, that's what I wanted to ask you, Jim was, was, I, I, I may not have couched the question, right. But, um, mm -hmm. the question that I had was, you know, after, after Kenner was in a post star Wars world. What was the process for for your team into getting onto other product lines that weren't Star Wars? In other words, how did designers like yourselves campaign to get on new lines, or how were those teams chosen, or were you just the default guys that were assigned to each new line they came up with? Well, pre prelim design, where where I was working, we were since we were um, the advanced concept area, mm -hmm. uh, we would look at uh, inventor product. Uh, we'd come up with our own ideas, things like uh, Stretch Armstrong and Baby Alive were kind of internally developed. <clears throat> and then we would look at every license. Uh -huh. So towards the end of my uh, towards the end of my involvement in intimate involvement in Star Wars, I was working on Strawberry Shortcake, so it was completely mm -hmm. different. You know, I designed play sets for Strawberry at the same time <clears throat> we were working on Star Wars. So it, really? it was, <clears throat> our area was, you know, involved in all the the advanced stuff. And then the uh, there were some things that got developed in uh, production areas, but for the most part, we did all the interaction with um, Hollywood studios and stuff. The other thing I was working on, I did, I did the original. I did layout drawings for the original Alien. Oh, yeah. I I, I went to England with Jim Black and came back after meeting Giger and uh, seeing the sets and all that stuff. Seeing the Alien, I came back recommending that we not do it. <laughs> huh. Oh, really? <laughs> Scary. <laughs> but <clears throat> he he was. He was done as partially to keep our relationship with the uh, studios. Um, it was like, well, we'll do the one figure and then we, you know, because Kenner wanted to and was the uh, person, the the company that people came to for new I, new properties and stuff mm -hmm. for a long time. And it was part of that alien thing. So I was... I got to work on Strawberry Shortcake. I got to work on Alien, and I got to work on Star Wars, and a little bit of Care Bears, and whatever else came in the door. You know, uh -huh. we looked at all kinds of stuff, material. So, of Alien, I I do know that there were some figures that were were prototyped at the very least. Did you have a hand in those? No, that was done oh. done in production. Okay. I just I did the I did the layout drawing. I did layout drawings and cost on the eighteen inch, and then. They was free to do whatever they wanted, but I didn't work on it. Yeah, wow. they were pretty cool stuff. It, and all that, you know, the later stuff, the Predator versus Alien, <coughs> those movies were inspired by designers at Kenner. 
Not me. Oh, wow. Okay. They they actually influenced uh, the studio into, hey, why don't you do these cool, you know, clashing between the ultimate predators. Sure. So, th so does that also mean that you, despite also, you know, you said you, you were liaisoning with the movie studios to keep those relationships going. Were you also asked to look at, you know, uh, in-house concepts like Mask and Centurions and things like that throughout the 80s that Kenner was doing in-house? And were you sort of the, fir the front line team for those as well? Uh, some of those might have come out of preliminary design. Mm -hmm. But before, at Kenner were open, to, you know, they were open to anybody coming up with an idea. Uh huh. <clears throat> Mask was internally developed, but I'm not sure where, where it started. Right. Because by the time it was being done, I was in marketing. Oh, I see. Okay. I moved to the dark side. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, speaking of marketing, Tom, unless you have something immediately on the tip of your tongue. Um, no, I, I, I do have a question. Okay, um, go ahead. You know, now that star wars had blown out onto the scene and everybody was just going crazy you know we know that other shows or television had brought uh battlestar galactica and, and buck rogers and that kind of thing um did those franchises i mean i know they eventually went with other toy companies did they come to kenner at all before they went to someone else you know what I'm, do you know what I mean? Yeah, I'm not sure. Some of them might have. Okay. Um, some of them may have been too close. We, uh, after Star Wars got started, um, and when I was just leaving Prelim in 79, Jim Black went from being a product manager, director in marketing. He became the marketing liaison with licensing. <clears throat> so he may have used, used stuff that, I wouldn't have seen, but they were, they, they, she, he was pretty well connected and he probably would have seen stuff <clears throat> and they may have reviewed things that never made it to prelim or anywhere else. Interesting. Uh, we have a super chat here from Matt Deckard saying, did I come in a bad time? Uh, no, Matt, you're right on time and this will be able to be replayed as many times as you like. Um, <laughs> Now, uh, I, I was just curious, Jim, when did you start to get wind? Because, you know, Tom and I have had these conversations with a lot of different people over the last few decades as we were kids playing with these toys like any toy is supposed to be played with. And while they're while everything is collectible and even toys themselves, like the Buck Rogers and Flash Gordon ray guns and things were already collectible with adults of previous generations most of the time toys were just toys and you buy them, you play with them, they either get given away or you lose them in the sandbox. Uh, that, that's traditionally how toys work. Um, did you, when did you start to find out, I guess is the question Yeah. that these toys were being sought after collected and dare I say revered by a disproportionate number of people as compared with other toy lines in history. When did you start to pick up on, on that? And what were your thoughts about that at the time? Well, I picked up on it way too late because mm -hmm. <laughs> if I'd been smarter, I would have had a truckload of that stuff. In the <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I, um, I'm not connected with the collecting end of things. I, uh, it didn't happen while I was at Kenner or working on any of the Star Wars stuff. So, mm -hmm. um, but I, uh, I, I don't know. It, mm -hmm. Kenner, <clears throat> the, I mean, Star Wars was unique in a lot of things, and it changed a lot of stuff. And I think collecting was one of those things. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it changed toy business, the marketing of toys, and the marketing of of movies, and then. Um, it became an intergenerational thing where people like you grew up with it and then decided to keep hold on to it. I mean, I hear many stories about people that regret their mom throwing everything away or putting sure. it on sale, but um, I don't know. It, it probably happened, uh, I, I'm guessing, after the trilogy or as the mm -hmm. trilogy was uh, ending, 
and there was kind of a space between the trilogies and the prequels. Right. But I'm, I'm not sure. It's it's a phenomenon that has taken on a whole new dimension. Because I, you know, I used to collect some stuff, but mm -hmm. and I've seen some super collections. I mean, you both have pretty good ones. And Thanks. I appreciate that. I mean, um, I'm 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 not a collector. I I, I can't afford it now. There are other things that are happening, but um, sure. But I, I appreciate it. It's it's astounding. I see. You know, there's a fellow here in town that collects anything Admiral Akbar. <laughs> other people that concentrate on other characters. You know, Ashoka. Uh -huh. Right, Ashoka. Now she's like there are people that concentrate on her. Uh -huh. Sure. Um, and I, I love going to, I love going out to events and meeting people that, you know, there's a dad and his son and his grandson and pretty soon it'll be great grandsons uh, oh. or daughters too. Mm -hmm. um, all enjoying, you know, Star Wars is kind of an event for them. Right? Wow. The thing that ties them together. It is kind of like the force, the toy. <laughs> Kenner toys are the force that binds this the uh, binds the world together. Yeah, it must be it, Jim. It must be just bizarre that uh, you know you're you're a huge part of this. And how does that how uh, does that make you feel? I'm blown away. I just you know I I've um, this is my third career or someone of you know my another life because I've. Um, you know, I do events, I, and it's pretty heady to walk through celebration and have people stop and ask for a photograph. Yeah, uh -huh. and uh, uh -huh. and be recognized. <clears throat> and uh, you know, Plastic Galaxy was the first thing that got me recognized. I was my first event was in Mexico City, and it was. Uh, a promoter that had been doing shows and he was going to do one called the unboxing toy show. And he saw plastic galaxy and asked me to come down and had, I think five star Wars actors. And that was really the beginning of it all. And, uh, uh, so it's, it's pretty, it's pretty amazing to continue to do this. I, the, um, I was at celebration. I sat on two panels, um, and, and this year, yeah, this year I did uh, yeah one on Boba Fett and one on the toys that made us. Uh huh. But um, I've never been invited to celebration. I've never been like an official guest. So you but, had to come before. The, were you an official guest this time though? No, no, I bought oh. my tickets. Oh, wow. so you have to buy your tickets like every other every, every right. other guy out there, every other person out there. I bought one for one day in England. Just mm -hmm. in case I can go. The good thing wow. is I get to travel a lot, so I, I don't have a problem that way. Sure. Uh, Wolfie wants to ask you, Jim, what was the last project or vehicle you remember working on for Star Wars? Uh, the last one was the Tauntaun. Um, the the first version of it, not the uh -huh. one split belly, but that was the second use of the trap door. Uh huh. <laughs> and I had. Uh, between the first two movies, Jim Black and I went to England to see the sets. And that's when we saw the Tauntaun and Yoda for the first time. Oh, uh, wow. That so I came be. back and mocked that, mocked that up. Talk about some uh, NDAs there for you. I guess they just, was it a gentleman's agreement? They just trusted you. Hey, don't say anything. Don't let anything out. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, they, we did understand that. We yeah. were, we were um, I wasn't allowed to take a camera with me. Uh-huh. Um, but uh yeah i i drew doodles and stuff so i had some sketches that i could come back to but sure. yeah we i mean kenner it was to our advantage not to let anybody know what was going on yeah but we uh, got to see the hoth uh hanger and uh, the maquettes and the big i mean they had full-size tauntauns yeah wow that's amazing I was uh, you know, just absolutely mind blowing have getting the chance to see the movie. You know, the first movie pretty much before the world. Mm -hmm. And uh now coming on the set of the second movie would would have just been quite uh, quite quite an opportunity. Mm. Yeah. I 
I had the best time of anybody, anybody, and <clears throat> at least on the toy side of it. Sure. Yeah. Travel and do stuff. The first trip I made out to California was um, by myself was the one that's featured in the, the toys that made us. Mm -hmm. But I got to see X, you know, I finally got to see that was in April. Um, so I got to see X-Wings and TIE Fighters and the Death Star before the viewing on May, in May. Wow. But, um, I got to meet some of the people, you know, John That's Dijkstra and stuff, because I got to go to the ILM studio in Manai. So oh, it, was, yeah. it was really, I, and um, I, I've, you know, people ask if I've met George Lucas, and I do. He would never remember, I'm sure. <laughs> But I, you know, I did meet a lot of those people in passing. I got, you know, I, I went out to California when they were doing the Christmas special and saw the sets for that. Oh, man, Tom, this is your wheelhouse now. So it was, you know, and it, you, you just, you know, try and take it all in. But there isn't any way to kind of convey how exciting that was for some mid guy, a guy from the Midwest. Yeah. <laughs> now, going, talking about the uh, talking about the uh, holiday special, um, I do know that there are prototypes of the Wookies. How how close did we get to actually getting those figures? Um, I don't think you got very close. Okay, that's the, a the, well. <laughs> I don't know if I because we still don't we we still don't have a lumpy figure and I'm I'm waiting ever so patiently. Well, maybe someday uh, Super Seven will do it or something. <laughs> but uh, I, I I'd rather you would have done it, but that you know Super yeah. Seven I'll take at this that, point. Yeah, I I went out to the, see the sets for it and then um, I don't know I think it was I don't know, when did it air in seventy eight nineteen seventy nine no seventy eight seventy eight. So I went November 78. Working. I went, I remember going out and seeing the sets and I met Anthony Daniels in passing. He was like going by. <clears throat> so it's like, and I came home and um, they decided to show the Christmas special. They sent us a videotape so we could show it to the sales person, people. And now 1978, um, it was a good thing nobody from Lucasfilm was in the room. <laughs> did not get a very good reception from the sales force. So I was really glad that there wasn't anybody there to kind of, you know, take the brunt of their, of that. But now it's a classic. Now everybody's like, oh, you can, I mean, now that you well, anything Star Wars. The holiday special, of course, was a mix of Star Wars and, uh, you know, variety shows mm -hmm. back then. Because if you remember, variety shows, of course, were were the thing. Everybody everybody had a variety show. Yep. So I think what they did is they they combined Star Wars because everybody loved Star Wars. And they thought they, you know, uh, because it definitely wasn't Lucas who created this. It was a bunch of TV execs. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I... Uh, we're missing missing some great play sets there, <laughs> but uh, that's okay. Yeah, well, <laughs> it would have been interesting. Yeah, uh, you're you're right. It's probably a good idea that there were no Lucasfilm execs, but because they probably would have just went, what 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 happened here? <laughs> uh, Lyo Convoy reviews uh, wants to ask you, Jim. He says, I don't know if this has been asked yet or not, but what made Kenner decide to stick with five points of articulation for the figures? Were there any ideas for additional articulation? I guess he's referring to maybe knees or elbows. Yeah. <clears throat> well, yeah, there probably was, but it's all a cost issue. Mm -hmm. and, you know, how, what value they are. <clears throat> Between the movies, there may have been more discussion about that. But Right. Uh, we also have some questions here. Scott Hughes would like to ask you, is there something that you designed that did not make it into production? Oh yeah, it's a lot. Lots of stuff. Mm -hmm. My, it, and it's hard to d remember what what all we did show. Um, the only one that I know I did that I thought was pretty cool, and again I have to set this in 1977 mm -hmm. when there were no electronics and stuff. But I had a 
I designed a game <clears throat> that was a sphere, a Death Star sphere, and each you had four player, and you had a spring loaded X wing, and as the as the Death Star rotated, there was a trigger point where you could hit with your X wing, and it would explode, which I thought was a pretty fun game. Could have been, yeah, <clears throat> a lot of, pretty cool, but. Um, that one never made it. That's the one that I can clearly remember wanting. To, it, it was pretty cool, but we showed lots of stuff. It was, it was, uh, you know, it, somewhere along the way, uh, when I wasn't working for Kenner, but for um, we, my my consulting company, we presented doing the naked art C three PO as a twelve inch figure. Which would have been cool. It was pretty. It was a nice model. It was pretty, but I, I there weren't a lot of things that I can remember. We, you know, we did. We uh, there were lots of things that other people designed too that never made it. Uh huh. One of the things that made it through with much cajoling of Lucas was the uh, mini rigs. Uh huh. Yep. You know, the concept was it, he was very jealous, a, a little jealous at least about. Uh, bringing things in that were not it were not in the movie uh -huh. initially he didn't he didn't like the idea of of making stuff up uh -huh. uh, mini rigs was one where the storyline was these are things that were behind the scenes uh, running in the trenches on the Hoth planet or whatever right and that eventually broke through it was like oh well yeah we could do that you know yeah they're just off camera yeah um, and I, I didn't have anything to do with that kind of stuff but there were some, you know, people uh, doing that. That came. That actually was in the production design group, mm -hmm. where they presented. I and they were, they would come to prelim or the uh, line reviews and show stuff. And that one eventually made it through. Speaking of that idea, was did you have anything to do with the uh, the troop transport? Now there's a there's a vehicle that was just off camera, mm -hmm. so to speak. Did you have anything to do with that one? No. Okay. And now it's come back. They actually, I think, didn't they put it in? They uh, put it in, uh, yeah, the Mandalorian. Yeah. So there's another one where it, uh, you know, they managed to get it in because they wanted to do something to build armies. Right. And only, then, took, only took four decades. Yeah. And it came back and it's in the, it's in a new, you know, it's in a video. It's like, yeah. wow, you know. That was quite a treat to see that. So yeah, yeah. Um, we have. A, I don't think you, Jim. If you can't answer this, that's fine. But Brown Bat asks, "What made the battle damage stickers stick so well?" <laughs> I have no. Well, idea. I don't know. Somebody changed vendors or something. <laughs> the X wing that there is an X wing up here, right? Okay. That's the one I've had since I was a designer. Um, the labels are peeling off, and I've put some. Uh, I put some, you know, ones I bought online. Yeah, <laughs> they don't yep. stick very well either. So <laughs> I'll, I'll get, I'll, I'll try and get you a hookup with Zach Paris off of, uh, out of Australia. Yeah, and that there's some really good. They, he honors your work, sir. I'll put it that way. Um, World Made a Cardboard asks, "What Star Wars toy do you think Jim could have been better if something was made differently?" Hmm. Well, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I'm sure we could have improved on a lot of stuff, but <clears throat> you know, I'm, dealing with '70s and '80s technology is a little different. It would have been cool to have, you know, electronics in the X-wing. I mean, we the highest tech thing on the in the line was the uh, the red LEDs. Mm -hmm. We I remember we used to have the <clears throat> there was an engineer his name was George Giordano. And he would always talk about, we're, these are, he would call them floor sweepings. We can just get floor sweepings, you know, because the calculator business or something. And it was just like, they're not going to sweep the floors for LEDs to put on their toys. <laughs> right, right. Uh, but that's, that's the way we uh, tried to cost reduce, you know. It's like, you know, to put that red LED, that was pretty, uh, pretty advanced. Oh, yeah, yeah. 
it was you know led didn't even become a common term until what 15 years ago something like that because prior to that it was fluorescence and just light bulbs yeah um 70 year old me was happy to have it by the way uh, uh, yeah me too uh cumberbatch pepper pot asks kudos to the inventor or he does it's a statement kudos to the inventor of star wars four inch figures thank you for all you have done uh that's very kind uh and then uh nova mira wants to ask uh no it's another statement great live stream guys thanks for everything jim our favorite toys then and now and then kenny witty says thank you for your time today jim did you have any designs uh oh you've already answered this question he asked about designs not approved that you wanted to get made but kenny i'm sure you already heard his answer uh about the uh death star game um so yeah so we're caught up uh tom you have the floor uh boy um what was i gonna ask <laughs> You want me to take it? I have a, I have an easy one. I have an okay. easy one. Yeah. Okay. So, Jim, you designed all these these toys and and all this stuff is is fantastic. Um, do you have a personal favorite figure that maybe you designed or maybe you didn't design of the of the vintage line that that you really liked especially? Well, my favorite character is C three PO. Yeah, I, that's I feel a good one. I feel a common bar. bar <clears throat> we can. I feel kind of uh, kin to him because <clears throat> he's kind of my. I'm not a very. I don't see myself as being very, very assuming, and not necessarily the most adventurous person. But um, he was. He was my favorite character of the aliens. Hammerhead's my favorite alien in the in the uh, cantina. <clears throat> but um, I. Uh, you know, there would there were there's lots that we could have done maybe, um, and things improved over time. Uh, we were up against some really tight deadlines. That's why parting lines were kept as flat as possible. The single plane articulation uh, was part of that um, because we were realizing that um, we were up against time crunch because yeah. we knew. The moment I read the script, if we had started working on the project, uh, we would still not have product until 1978. So, because uh, it took a year, and we were actually pressed. Uh, you figure from May when the movies broke, you still only had uh, nine months. <clears throat> so things, the schedules got really crunched. One of the I was at an event recently with one of the sculptors that worked on the initial Star Wars. And she she related a story that I had not heard um, <clears throat> that that I was involved in and do not remember. But she said, I came down to the sculpting department to talk to John Gardner, who ran the sculpting department at the time. And he said, he, I, I was, this is the story I heard that I had asked John how soon we could have finished sculptures on Star Wars figures. And he said, mm, I don't know, maybe nine months to have, or not something less, less than that. Or maybe it was three months. It would take us three months. And he said, because you can figure you have drawings and all that stuff. And I said, well, good, you have a month because <laughs> we want, we're going to be coming, you know, this is stuff's going to be coming like crazy. So he, she said he got on the phone and started calling all of his sculpting friends because he had come from Mattel. So he had a portfolio of people that he could call on and <clears throat> started calling people and saying, I think we have a, I think we're going to have a lot of work. And you, <laughs> What's your schedule look like? So we had for the first, first year, we probably had most of the sculptors in America that knew how to do toy design working on Star Wars most talented ones. Wow. You know, C-3PO is the best example. Now, now the, the, they're talented sculptors that work in, you know, they worked in this proprietary hard wax that Kenner used. But the C-3PO, um, the 12 inch one especially, was done by a sculptor that does use, works in acetate. Mm -hmm. 
So if you look at that 12 inch figure, that was done in a subtractive material. You take a block of acetate or pieces of acetate and start cutting away the acetate. Yeah. And if you make a mistake, anything large, you have to start over. That the fellow that did that, the the sculpture was it was a piece of art. It was just incredible. I have to say that the twelve inch sculptures uh, are probably the vintage twelve inch sculptures of all the figures that were created are by far better than any that have been done since because i think the artistry and the, the likenesses of luke and uh han harrison ford mark hamill carrie fisher were just phenomenal i just i just don't think that that the, the likenesses have been close since then so yeah. whoever sculpted the uh those particular figures were just did a fantastic job i have to admit it's mm -hmm. just great yeah the, the, and one of those things that we talked about some people have asked why the sculptures, the small ones especially, don't look like the actors. And uh, part of that was that uh, they would, since no one knew, the actors all went into this pretty much blind. They hadn't, you know, George was a talented filmmaker, but they didn't know what he was doing. And doing a science fiction it could have been a real bomb. So some of the some of the actors didn't necessarily necessarily want the uh, sculptures to look exactly like them, for fear that if it was a bomb, that years later they would be presented with, you know, what about this this uh, character that you know this doll that looks <laughs> like you. And if it was yeah. a bomb, they didn't want it necessarily to be um around as long as it might be so interesting so initially we didn't have a, a lot of res there was a little bit of restraint on making them look too much like um some of the some of the newest stuff though i've some of them are really talented in this yeah absolutely. and our sculptors it they they could have made them look exactly like them it's just whether or not everybody wanted them to uh, Plus, we, people, you know, people are pretty vain. They don't want, you know, they're, they, they did never think things look quite like they think they do. So it's like, I don't look like that. It's like, you're, I have a terrible voice when I'm, when I listen to the recordings of my voice, it's just, it's like, today it's a little lower because I have a little lower register because I have a little bit of a head cold. But. The con crud, Jim? Yeah, yeah. I came, <laughs> I came back with it. Two, yeah. You no, know, four flights and uh, being in a convention, it's uh, not always the best atmosphere. So sure. yeah, I mean, Absolutely. I'm staying away from people so that I don't pass it along. I don't have anything. I don't have any events coming up until right now till September. So. Oh, good. Yeah. It's a lot of handshakes and that you know, in the last couple of years, that's, that's a little on this spooky side. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, world made a cardboard says uh, there was a star Wars punch out book with paper toys of the tie fighter and X wing in either January of 78 or may of 78. He's trying to ask you, Jim, when the first star Wars Kenner toy was released approximately. Uh, well, first Kenner toy would have been, Late '77 would have been Christmas because we did we did do plaints and dip dots mm -hmm. and, and puzzles, I believe puzzles, and then mm -hmm. we did a, a board game, an all paper board game. Yep, <clears throat> but that would have come out in '77, mm -hmm. and then uh, we shipped the first uh, the first um, figures, I think, in February and March. The 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 people that bought the uh, early bird. The early bird mm -hmm. they got their figures i think in march february mm -hmm. march and that was a push to get that those out that fast oh sure so. well, i'm assuming that uh, i'm assuming that marketing had the had the selection of the figures that that eventually made it into the early bird uh yeah uh, but it was pretty obvious 
Yeah. It was, it was not a big, it wasn't like a mystery of what was going to go in there. Right. But um, yeah, they did. And some of them might have been, you know, we wouldn't have known that pretty early on. Yeah. Good first selection. And I didn't have anything to do with the early bird. It was a concept that came up. A couple of people have claimed it, but not me. It was a brilliant, it was a brilliant marketing thing. And Oh, yeah. And the, it wasn't so much the sales, but the PR was incredible. Mm -hmm. Well, Tom, uh, we are almost at the 90-minute mark. Uh, oh. Well, no, hold on, hold on. I want to let you exit out uh, with this. And also, uh, Jim, uh, when we do end the stream, uh, I just hope you'll hang on for about 90 seconds uh, afterwards in the in the, in the the back chat because uh, Tom and I would just like to thank you uh, after the stream is over. But uh, we'll keep it brief. But, um, Tom, I want to give you the... Uh, the last question, of course, and also just I want you to exit and end this amazing interview uh, with us and Jim, because, Jim, you're a hero to a whole generation of kids. And um, I'm glad that you've found yourself being asked for photographs. I'm glad that you've, uh, you know, been been uh, courted uh, to come out and talk about this stuff for the last few years and been in Plastic Galaxy Alongside Tom, by the way, Tom was in Plastic Galaxy as well. So there's two. I, yeah. I'm the guy who says uh, Kenner Star Wars toys are like a drug. If you remember that, <laughs> yeah. Jim. Uh, I have but, to go back and find. I have to find it. I moved, um, and I, I can't find either DVD of of Plastic Galaxy or uh, the toys that made us. And I, I need to review them again. So. Oh, I'll send you both my copies. I'm not in, <laughs> I'm not in plastic galaxy. So, you know, no, I'm kidding. I'm not in plastic galaxy, but yeah. that's not why. No, I'll send you both. I'll send you, I have them both. I'll send you both. If you'd like, they're, they're minty. So, um, <laughs> but, uh, Tom, uh, first Jim, I just want to thank you for taking the time to talk with all of us today. Um, it's been an absolute privilege, uh, like I said, you're a hero to our generation and uh, you're you're a rock star in many ways to our generation. But uh, thank you for, for, for Tom, especially uh, Tom is the the best ambassador for the collector side and the generational side of Star Wars that I've ever seen. And that's why he's a dear friend of mine. So, Tom, I'd like you to end this stream with Jim any way you like. Oh, Jim, just. Thank you so much because you know before before Star Wars we had Six Million Dollar Man and uh, you know Tinker Toys and uh, since then you've created so many happy kids. Uh, just thank you and it, it's fantastic that you know you it was just a job for you but it, it's it's so much more for everybody else out there the kids that grew up in the 70s and 80s so. Well, uh, it's fantastic. And I'm glad you're a part of it. And I'm glad that, you know, I can say, at least say hi to you. It doesn't matter if you remember me, but uh, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a joy to, to say hello to you every once in a while. If, when I see you at celebration and that kind of thing. So, well, um, you're, you're an awesome guy and, and thank you so much for joining us today. It's mm -hmm. it, to speak with you for an hour and a half was, was absolutely an honor and a treat. So thank you my pleasure and uh with that everybody the next iconicon event will be coming up in about 30 minutes you can check the schedule on iconicononline.com i want to thank jim once again for taking the time please if you haven't uh been to igrupstarwars.com you should check it out it's tom's long-standing portal for the generational experience of star wars and with that, we will end this broadcast. And uh, Jim, just stick around for just a minute or two uh, after the broadcast, and then we will let you uh, go on your way, sir. So everybody, see you on the next Iconicon video in 30 minutes.